Alright guys, let's get started. Uh, we have a lot to discuss today. Again, thank you DJ Drop Tables for keep keeping everything fresh. Alright, so um, before we get into today's lecture, let's go through real quickly what's on the schedule for you guys coming up for the next two weeks. So homework three is out today. Uh, it, should, it should be on the website. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll set up Gradescope so you can submit later today. And so that'll be due next week on Wednesday the 9th. Um, in two weeks, we will have the, the, the midterm exam. Project two is going out today. So I'll talk about, a little bit, I'll talk about that at the end of this, this lecture. Uh, but that'll be due after the midterm. The midterm will be on Wednesday the 16th in this room uh, at, at the normal class time. And it'll be you know, an hour and 20 minute exam. And so this will cover everything up to and including next week's lectures. So on Wednesday the 9th, the, the midterm will cover that lecture and everything prior to that. Okay? Any questions about any of these expectations? So homework, two, homework three, knock that out before the midterm. And then this thing, project two, it'll encompass some of the uh, material that we talked about that'll be relevant to the midterm, but it won't be due officially until after, after the midterm. So you space, space things out for you guys. Okay? Okay. So where we're at now in the semester is that we, again, going up to this architecture layers, uh, we know how to store things on disk, in pages, we know how to then copy them into memory into our buffer pool manager as needed. Then we talked about how we actually access them. So we can build indexes on top of them or, or we can do sequential scans. And so now where we're at is up above, now we actually want to start executing queries. We actually want to be able to take SQL queries, uh, generate query plans for them, and then have them use the access methods to get access to the data that, that we need. Okay? So for the next two weeks, we're going to first talk about how, what, how we actually implement the algorithms for our operators and our queries. Then we'll talk about different ways to process queries themselves, like what's the, how do we move data from one operator to the next. And then we'll talk about also to the, to the more system architecture, what's the runtime architecture of the system for threads or processes, and how do we organize them to run you know, queries in parallel. So I'm not going to go into detail what a query plan looks like uh, just yet. I just want to show you what, what one potentially looks like, just to frame the conversation where we're going today in the next class. And then we'll go into way more detail about what query plan execution looks like uh, next week. And then when we talk about query optimization, query planning further. So a, a query plan is essentially the, the instructions or the high level direction of how the database system is going to execute a given query. And we're going to organize the query plan into in, in, in a tree, tree structure or an acyclic directed graph. So we can take this SQL query like this, or we're doing a join with a filter on table A and B. We can represent it as a query plan like this, where at the leaf nodes, we're doing our scans or accessing the, the tables. And then we, we're moving tuples up to the next operator to do whatever it wants to do. So in this case here, we scan A. And since we don't have any filter on it, we just feed it right into our join operator. And then for the scan on B, we'll first apply the filter to, to, to limit out any values less than 100. And then we feed that into our join operator. And then this now produces some output that's then fed into the projection operator. So what I'm showing here is what we would call it is a, is a logical plan. Meaning I'm not saying anything about how we're, what algorithm we're going to use to implement all these different operators. I'm just saying this is at a high level what I want to do. It's almost like a direct translation of the relational algebra. I want to do a join. I'm not telling you how I want, want to do the join. I just, I just want to do one on A and B. I want to get tuples from A. I didn't tell you whether to do a sequential scan or an index scan. I'm just saying just get tuples from A. So what we're focusing on today is now to talk about what these algorithms actually are. And then we'll put it all together when we talk about query planning, query optimization, to say, now we need to make a decision of here are the different choices of algorithms I could use or different access methods I could use for my query. Which one is going to be the best for me? So today's lecture is really focusing on, and, 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 and for Wednesday's lecture as well, for this week, what are the different algorithms we can implement for the, for the physical operators in our query plan? But at a high level, we're assuming that it's in this tree structure where we're moving tuples from one operator to the next. So is this clear? Right, this is essentially what, what, you know, what, what any, any query engine is going to do. Right? They're going to represent it as a, tree, as a data flow tree, and they, they're moving tuples between them. So the tricky thing, though, now, that for us, when we start deciding what, how, you know, how do we actually implement the, the algorithms for these operators, is that 
again, we, 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 this entire semester is focusing on, the, on, on a system that's, that's assuming that data doesn't fit entirely in memory. So just like with a, in, a, in our disk-oriented database system, just like we can't assume that tables fit entirely in memory or indexes can't fit entirely in memory, we now need to be worried about that the intermediate results between those operators cannot actually fit entirely in main memory. So therefore, when we design the algorithms we're going to use to execute you know, the operator we need, we need to pick ones that actually know how to write data at the disk and be mindful that we may have to read and write data from disk and therefore we'll make certain design decisions in those algorithms to, to accommodate them. Right? So just as a quick example, I'm doing a join here on A and B. The hash table, or depending on you know, what, what join algorithm I'm going to use, I may have to spill to disk. Like A doesn't fit in memory, B doesn't fit in memory, so I need a join algorithm that can handle you know, inputs where the entire data set may not fit in memory. Furthermore, the output also may not fit entirely in main memory. So again, we're going to use our buffer pool manager that we built uh, in the first project and we talked about before, that's how we're going to be able to accommodate algorithms that need more memory than, than is actually available. So we're not just using it for tables, not just using it for, for, uh, for indexes, we can use it for intermediate results. And this again goes back to what I was saying before, this is why the, you know, if the database system manages own memory instead of letting the OS do it, the OS can know, oh, this page is for an ephemeral data structure to do whatever my query is, and I'm going to throw it away right immediately after the query is over. And maybe I want to do different things or have different replacement policies or different strategies for those kind of pages and those kind of data versus the data coming from, from the underlying tables. Whereas the OS doesn't see that. The OS doesn't know anything about what, what's inside these pages or how they're being used. So again, we're going to use our buffer manager to be able to spill algorithms to disk, and therefore, we're going to design algorithms and prefer algorithms that are going to maximize the amount of sequential I.O. that we can do. And this is going to be different than any algorithms course you've taken potentially before, where you assume that you're just reading and writing into memory and everything has uniform access. Uh, and now we need to be mindful of what's actually in memory when, when we design uh, these approaches. So we're going to first start off talking about the external merge sort algorithm. Um, and what will come out of this discussion, you'll see some high-level strategies for essentially doing divide and conquer that allow us to then, uh, that we can apply to other methods or other operators we want to implement. And then we'll finish up talking about how to do aggregations, uh, which can rely on the sorting algorithm, but then it also sort of segue in, uh, into the join algorithm stuff we talk about next week about hash joins. So there's sort of this trade-off between sorting versus hashing as the two different methods you can use to execute algorithms in your database system. We're going to first talk about sorting, and then we'll, we'll, we'll add in hashing at the end. Okay? All right, so it's sort of obvious that, you know, why we need to sort, but just make sure that everyone puts this in the, in the correct context. The, in the relational model, the tuples in our relations are inherently unsorted. Right? It's set algebra, there's no sort order, so we can't assume that the, the data as we read them is in any, any one particular order. Now, there's clustering indexes that we talked about uh, before, and we'll talk about again today, which then you know, provide you a, uh, enforces a sort order based on some index, but in general, we can't assume that's always going to be the case. And furthermore, we could have an index, our, our table could be clustered on one particular key, but now we need to sort it on another key, so that you know, being pre-sorted doesn't actually help us in that, that scenario. So, in addition to also now being able to, you know, if someone calls an order by and we want to sort the output, we, if our data is sorted, there's a bunch of op other optimizations we can do for other utility things we want to do or queries we want to execute in our database system. So, if our table is, is sorted, our output is, or our keys are sorted, then it's really easy to do uh, duplicate elimination. Because now I just scan through the table once, and if I see that the thing I'm looking at is the same as the one I saw in the last thing I looked at, then I know it's a duplicate, and I can just throw it away. For group buys, this is the same thing. I can, if everything's pre-sorted, then I can generate the aggregations by just scanning through the table once and computing the running totals as needed. And then we talked about optimization of doing bulk, so bulk loading in a B-plus tree, where you pre-sort all the, the, the data along the leaf nodes, and then you build the index from the, from the bottom up rather than top down. And that's way more efficient. So again, sorting is a, is, a, uh, is a useful utility operation we're going to need in our database system, but we need to be able to accommodate one where we, it doesn't fit entirely in memory. Because if it fits in memory, then we just pick whatever your favorite sorting algorithm that you, you know and love from your intro classes, and that works just fine for us. 
quick sort, heap sort, if you're crazy, bubble sort, right? We don't care. It's in memory. So all the things that we learned before in, in you know, intro to algorithms class work just fine. But again, the issue is now if it doesn't fit in memory, quick sort's going to be terrible for us. Because what is quick sort doing? Quick sort is doing a bunch of random pivots jumping around to memory in different locations. That's random I.O. in our world because those pages we're jumping into may not actually fit in memory. And in worst case scenario, we're, get, we're having one I.O. cost per, you know, per change to the, 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 you know, the, the data set. So instead, we want an algorithm that is mindful of the potential cost of reading and writing data to disk and therefore make certain design decisions that try to maximize the amount of sequential I.O. Because sequential I.O., even on faster SSDs, is going to be more efficient than, uh, than random I.O. Because you can bring a lot more data in with a single, and there's no seek in, a, in an SSD, but within a single, you know, with a single uh, read operation or write operation down into the device, you can get more data coming back. All right? So the... I'm going to use, and, and at a high level, this is what every, this is what every single database system does that supports uh, out of memory sorting. It's called the external merge sort. All right, sometimes it's, it's, you see ex external sort merge, and it'd be really confusing because there'll be, there's the external merge sort algorithm, and then we'll see a, a sort merge join, which could use the merge sort algorithm, right? But I'll try to make it more clear when we talk about joins what we're actually doing. So as I said, this is a divide and conquer approach where we're going to basically split the data set that we want to sort up into these smaller chunks called runs. And then we're going to sort those runs individually, right? All the keys within a given run are, are sorted, and this, the runs are disjoint subsets of the entire key set we want to sort. And so then we're going to sort these little, these little runs, and then we're going to uh, start combining them together to create, create larger sorted runs. And we keep doing this and doing this until we get the full data set, the full key set that, that we want sorted. So there's two phases for this. So the first phase, again, we're going to take as many blocks as we can fit in memory, sort them, and then write them back out to disk. Then in the second phase, again, that's when you go combine these subsort sorted runs into larger sorted runs and then write them out. And you keep doing this over and over until you have the entire thing sorted. So this is going to end, end up taking potentially multiple passes through the data set that we're trying to sort, but in the end, we end up with a complete sorted run. So let's start with a simple example called a two-way merge sort. All right, so two-way means that we're, we're, the number two is that it's the number of sorted runs we're gonna, we're gonna merge together for every single pass. All right, so within a pass, we're gonna go grab two runs, merge them together, and produce a new, pass, a new run that's, that's the combination of the two smaller ones that, that were our input. So our data set is going to be broken up into n pages. And then what's now important for us when we consider what, how our algorithm is going to work is that we need to know how much memory is available to us to, to buffer things in memory to do our sorting. Because again, if, if everything fits in memory, then we don't need to do any of this. We just do quick sort. But we need to be told ahead of time how much memory we're allowed to use for sorting. And this is actually something you can configure in database systems. So in Postgres, it's called working memory. You basically say how much memory the, a, a one particular query is allowed to use for whatever kind of intermediate operation wants to do. Building a hash table, doing sorting, and other things like that. So we're told this, we're always told this B ahead of time. So let's look at sort of visual example. So in pass zero, you're going to read every B pages from the table into memory. And then you're going to sort them in place in memory and then write them out. So let's really simple example. I have a disk. On disk, I have my, my data set. I have two pages. So let's say this case here, I can only have, uh, I, can, I can bring in the first page, sort that in place, and now that's a sorted run. And then I write that sort of run out the disk. And I'm going to do this one at a time, assuming I must have a single thread. I'm going to do this one at a time for all my other pages, right? So now, so this is sort of step one, and then now over here, I'm reading the other page, I bring that into memory, sort it, and then I write that out. So now, that's the end of pass zero, that I've taken all the, the, the my sort of runs, or sorry, all my, my, I grab a run that's the size of B pages, I sort that in memory, because I have B pages I'm allowed to use in memory, so I'm sorting that in place, and then I'm writing it back out. And then I go to the next run, once after that's done. So now in the subsequent passes, we're going to do recursive merges 
of all the runs we sorted so far, and we're going to combine them together to produce runs that are double the size of my input. Right? And so for this approach, I need at, I, I need at least three buffer pages. Because I need to have uh, one, two buffer pages for each of the two runs that I'm bringing into memory, and then another buffer page for the output that I'm writing out. So in this case here, I, could, I say I want to sort these, these are the two sort of guys. So I bring those in memory. And then now I have one other page where I can write out the, the, the combination of these two guys. But I, you know, this is two pages long, but I only have one page. So I'm just going to scan through each of these and compare them one by one to see which one's greater than the other. Sorry, which one's less than the other, depending on what order you're going. And then I just write that out into a sorted page like this. And then once that's full, then I write that out to disk. And then my, my merging continues where I keep going down, think of like two cursors or scanning through these guys, comparing them one by one. Then I continue down with the other data set and I write that, write that page out. And then once I reach the end, then I have, then I'm done. So is this clear? Yes. So her question is, if, if the memory, in this case here, memory can hold three pages, why not just do exactly what I just did here first? Uh, yeah, you could think of like, and this, and this is a sort of simple example. You could think of like, I could bring, uh, I could bring the two sorted pages, uh, unsorted pages in memory, sort them in place, then do the combination without having to write them back on the disk. Yes. But in general, that's like, that's, this is a trivial example. In general, that's not, you can't do that. Uh, this is also sort of an oversimplification too, because think of these are like the data pages of the of the tuple or the or the table, right? They're, these have tuples in them. You actually really can't kind of do this the the, the in-place sorting like this, you would because that would be modifying the actual table itself, and you don't want to do that. So in general, usually like, like you're not going to do this one step here where I was sorting them in place. You'd make another copy and then write that out. So in that case, that wouldn't work because you would need you would need at most four pages in memory. Okay. So, so this is sort of, again, this, this is a sort of a simplification, uh, but let's actually work through the math now and see what actually what happens. So let's go through a, a more, a, a more fine grained example here. So the way the math works out is the number of passes we need for this two way merge sort is one plus the ceiling of log two N, right? And the first one here, the one, that's for, that's for the first pass. And then the log 2n is, is as, you, as you keep dividing up the, um, in each pass, you're sort of getting larger and larger runs until you reach the total size of, of the data set, right? The last pass, the two runs that you're sorting will, will be, you know, at most half the size of, of the total data, data set. So the total I/O cost to do an external merge sort is two n times the number of passes, and this is two n because I always have to read it in and write it out, right? For every pass, it's one read in and then one write out. So it means also in every pass, at most, I'm reading, I'm reading and writing every record, every key that I'm trying to sort exactly once, once in and then once back out. So let's look at an example like this. Right, so we have a bunch of pages, and in each page we have two keys in them. So, and then there's a little marker to say, here's the end of file. So, in the first pass, we're just going to read in every page, sort it, and then write it back out. So we're not examining data across different pages. Or these are actually runs, but it's, it's a, it's a one-page run. Then in the next pass, I'm going to go grab two, two, two sorted runs that are next to each other, bring them to memory, sort them globally within, within the two pages, and then write those guys out. So in this case here, the output of the second pass will be runs of, of size two pages. And then I do the keep, this, keep this going down. Second page, now I have four, run, four page runs, and the last one, I have an eight page run. And in here point, I'm done because now my output run is the total size of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the number of keys that I have. So, in the, what I've shown you so far, all right, for the two-way merge sort, 
As I said, it only requires three buffer pages, two for the input, one for the output. So back, going back here, when I was creating this, this, uh, you know, now creating a run that's two pages, I actually use this example. So now I'm creating a run that has four pages. I can only have three pages in memory, right? So I have, I'm gonna have one for the, the right side, or the left side, one for the right side. So again, you think of just have a cursor. I'm just scanning through each of the pages on, on the two sides and then compare to see whether one is greater than the other. And if the one is less than the other, then that's what I write out to my output and then move that cursor down. And then I do the same comparison, right? So I keep going step by step until I reach the end, the cursor reaches the ends of both of them. Yes? Are each of the numbers considered tuples? The question is, and what, is my, what am I showing here? Are these numbers considered tuples? Yes, I'm showing the simplification, they're keys, but in, in, in actuality, in, in a real system, you would have like the key you're trying to sort on and then the record ID where it came from. Yes? So does that mean that each of the squares is a page or is it the whole row? In this example here, each square is a page. Okay. Right, but I'm sh there's only two keys in the page for, for sim simplicity. Okay, so again, for this example here, we only have, we only need two pages. But the problem is, say I say, all right, I give you more pages, and what I'm showing so far, you're not actually gonna get any better, right? Why? So he, he's right, the I over remains the same, because what am I doing? I'm going fetching two pages, and then I have this cursor that's going to walk through them, and then whatever one has the, uh, you know, has the, the lower key, that gets written out to the third page. Having more pages in memory doesn't really help us because, you know, eventually I'm, I'm only can do in comparison, at, you know, two pages at a time. So a really simple optimization to uh, to minimize this this you know, this I/O cost is to do prefetching. So this technique is called double buffering. The idea is that when you go and start merging, say, two other pages, you have a bunch of shadow pages or shadow buffers where you start fetching in the, the next runs you need to sort or the next pages you need to sort. So it requires you to have do asynchronous I.O. to have something in the background go and fetch the, the next pages you're going to need so that when the cursor reads, reaches the end of the, the current page it's operating on, the next page that it needs is there. If it's single threaded and every, everything's synchronous, then you have this ping pong effect where I'm gonna be CPU bound, then disk bound, then CPU bound, then disk bound. Cause I'm gonna bring the page in and wait for that, then do my sorting, that's all CPU. Then I'm done doing that sorting or done doing the merging. And now I have to get to the next page and I'm, I'm blocked on that, right? So really simple example here. I wanna sort one. And then while I'm doing that in the background, I, was, I go fetch page two. And then by the time I'm sorting this one, then when that's done, then when, when this guy's ready to go for me. Okay. All right, so this is, this, you know, the two-way merge sort is a sort of the most simple way to consider this. We need to consider how this works with a general, uh, you know, a general n-way sort or k-way sort. Yes, sorry. Uh, how can you compute uh, sorts and at the same time you do Loading from this. So this question is, how do you how do you do this optimization here? How do you can you have the thread uh, sorting while in the background it, there's it's going fetching data? Well, this is actually where the operating system helps us, right? So we make a request from the operating system, go read this for us, and then it has another thread that's called asynchronous I/O. In the background, it goes fetch the data we need. We tell it where we, where to put it. Uh, and then that way our thread can do all the computation as well. Actually, the database system can do this well. You actually don't, don't need the OS. In, in a real system, you would have like a, like a IO dispatcher thread. So you say, I want this request, give me this page, and then give me, a, you know, here's a call out to tell me when it's actually ready. Then it goes and does that. Your thread can do whatever computation it wants, and then, then when it's done, it's available for you. Yeah, you have to have two threads. Yeah. Okay, so let's quickly go over how to generalize this algorithm beyond just having uh, just do just a two, you know, standard two-way sort. So with the general k-way sort, it's, it's still the same. We're going to use we're gonna B buffer pools. And then in the first pass, we're going to produce n divided by B, the ceiling of that sort of runs of size B. 
because right? that's where we're doing the in-place sorting. And then in the subsequent passes, we're going to do, we're going to generate B minus one runs at a time, right? And it's always minus one because we always need one buffer for the output. Having additional output buffers doesn't help us because we can really only write to one with one thread. We can only write to one output buffer at a time. So that's why it's B minus one. So the way the math works out is just an extension of what we showed before, where instead of now saying log two n or log two, it's log B minus one. And then you take the ceiling of n divided by B. But it's still the, the IO cost is 2n times the number of passes. So this is very plug and chuggy. You'll see this uh, when you do the homework, right? You fill in the Bs, fill in the Ns, and, and the, the numbers work out. So let's just walk through a really quick example here. So we want to sort 108 pages with, with five, uh, five buffers, pages we can use. So n equals 108, b equals 5. So in the first pass, right, the, the amount of IO that we're going to do is uh, well, we're trying to compute how many runs we're going to generate. So it's, it's the ceiling of 108 divided by 5. So that's going to generate two, 22 sorted runs of five pages each. Right? And then the last page, the last run is only three pages. So that's why you have, you have to take the ceiling. Because right? you, you don't want a fractional cost. And then going down in the subsequent passes, now you're taking the, the number of runs you, you, you generated at the previous pass and dividing that by the, the number of the size of the run you're going to generate before. Right? So now it was two, now it's four. So this generates six sorted runs of 20 pages, where the last page is the last run is only eight pages. And then just sort of going down, you just keep applying over and over again until you reach the very end, where you have now a the, the data set is, is exactly the same size as the original one. Yes? There are you assuming that the sorts are done again? His question is, are, are we assuming here the sorts are done in place? For the first pass, yes. For the subsequent passes, no. But as it, this is what the textbook does. In a real system, you wouldn't do that. Because again, the, the, depending on how, where you're reading the data from, it could, if it's coming directly from the table itself, then you can't modify that. If it's coming from another operator, then you, you can do that. Yes? Uh, what does the B minus 1? Does minus 1 mean like the output page? Yeah, the minus one goes because you always have to one, one buffer page for the output. Yeah. So I'm interested like the, this external works so I only use like three buffer pages. So yeah, in, in the in the general case, uh, it was it was three, right? right? Well, whatever. It's two for the input, one for the output. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's why here it uses five. Because I, I thought you said like it's one with like minus one three. This question is why am I using five here? So you're sorting. I thought, like you said, using five would not be like much faster. Yeah, sorry. Let me make sense. So before I was sorting two runs at a time. Right. This is now sorting multiple runs at a time, oh. right? So I'm, so say with B equals five, I bought five buffer pages. So for each of the sorted runs, I'm, I'm going to have five sorted runs. I'm going to try to merge at the same time. And again, all I need to do is just have a cursor sit at, at each one and walk through them one by one and just do a comparison across all of them and say which one is, is the which one is the smallest, write that out. And then, so now we have like four cursors. Now we have four cursors and one output. Yes. Yeah, I should, I should visualize that, sorry. Again, this is why I record it because I'll, I'll remember to do that next year. All right, is this clear? Okay. So that's external merge sort. They said this is this is the exact details of how you actually implement this uh, will vary from system to system. There's obviously some optimi other optimizations we can think about, like some hints to, to say, oh, I know the min value, the max value for my sorted run is is this and that, and my min max value for this other sorted run is that. So therefore, if I know that the 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 min value is is greater than the max value of this other sorted run, I don't need to do the merge. I just append the other one top of it, top of it, right? So there's some optimizations you can do like that, but in general, uh, what I've shown here today is works, you know, works well for 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 most data sets. Assuming uniform distribution of the values, there's no sort of uh, there's no locality to any of the data. If it's just completely random, this works fine. If you know something more about about your data, like it's skewed in a certain way, then you can apply some some, some simple techniques to speed this thing up. But this is what I've shown today is, is, is like the, the pickup truck version of it, the, the general purpose version of it. So 
instead of actually just doing the so the brute force brute force merge sort uh, that I showed here show now, there may be some cases where we can actually use the B plus tree to speed up our sorting operation. So in general, the sorting and, and join algorithms, those are actually the most expensive things to do. Always. So if there's any way we can speed these things up, this is always going to be a, a good choice for us. So what is the B plus tree essentially doing? Well, it's maintaining the, the uh, a sort order for our keys in the data structure. So we're paying you know, the penalty to maintain an update, do splits and merges as needed on our B plus tree as the table gets modified. But now we can then possibly piggyback off of that work we've already done to speed up our sorting by not having to do sorting at all. So if our sorting operation that we need, if the keys we want to sort on are the same keys that our B plus tree is indexed on, then we could potentially just reuse the B plus tree and not go through that whole external merge sort with multiple passes that I just showed. But it only works if we have a clustered B plus tree. Again, we showed an example of that, I think, uh, two classes ago. But now I want to show a sort of more uh, visual example of what, what actually is going on. And you'll see why this makes sense for sorting, but not for the unclustered one. So the clustered B plus tree, a clustered index, just means that the, the sort order or the, 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 the physical location of the tuples on our pages will match the sort order defined in the index. So if I have a index on, on key foo, then along my pages, there'll be the, the, the tuples will be sorted in pages based, based on that order of foo. So now if I want to do a sort on that key, I don't need to do an external merge sort because all I need to do is just get down to, to my leaf pages in my B plus tree, because now the, the sort order of the key will match the sort order of the of how the data is being is found. So I don't need to do any extra computation to, 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 to go sort it. It's already sorted for me. So this again, this is another example where the database system, the query planner that we'll, we'll talk about after the midterm, or the class before the midterm, the, the query optimizer can figure out, oh, you want to do a sort on this key? I already have a clustered index on that key. Let me go use that to generate the, the correct sort order and not even bother running external merge sort. But as we saw, we saw in the case of Postgres, they can't, they don't enforce this. You tell, I want to be clustered on an index or on a given key, they're not going to maintain that sort ordering. Other systems will do this. So now, if you have an unclustered index, unclustered B plus tree, this is actually the worst possible thing to use for trying to generate a sort order. And we take a guess why. It should be obvious. What's that? One Great, you have one I.O. per record. So again, I traverse the index to get down to, to the, the left side of the tree and I want to scan across and because that's how my, my keys are sorted. But the data has no connection to how the, it's being sorted in the index. So for every single record I got to go get and, and generate as my output, I may be doing another disk I.O. because the page I need is not in memory. I go to disk, go get it, bring my buffer pool, and then now the very next key that I look at is in another page, and I evict the one I just brought in and bring in the next one. Yes? Does the tree being unclustered mean that it's, like, is it have to be clustered on something, like it's just being clustered on like another index? The question is, what does it mean for a tree to be, you wouldn't say it is a, you don't say the, the tree is clustered, the table's clustered. Okay. Again, I wouldn't call it that. Like, if I was writing, you know, coming up with those terms, I would call it, oh, it's a sorted table. For whatever reason, they call it a cluster table, right? Because it's basically the, the tuples that are, that are similar to each other are clustered together in the page, right? So, again, back here, the, the sort order of, the, of how the tuple is actually being stored matches the sort order of the key. So, th this, this would be a clustered index, or, right? In this case here, if you just call create index, this is what you normally get. The keys are just, you know, the, the actual, where the records are actually being stored has no relation to how they're, they're being sorted. So what, like, what's the information in the tree? Then? This question is, what is the information in the tree? It's just the B plus tree we talked about before, right? right? So create index on, on, on key foo. So to build that index, I'm doing sequential scan, looking at every single tuple, getting their value of foo, inserting that into my tree, and the key value pair is the, the, the value of, fee, of foo, and then the, the value is the, the record ID, the pointer to the tuple. Okay. All right, this is different than the index organized uh, 
indexes or in, index organized tables we talked about where the tuple pages are actually in the leaf nodes themselves. In that case, that is a clustered index, but it's also an index organized table. This is like, if, if, they're not, if you're not storing the data in the leaf nodes themselves, if it's, if it, if it's disconnected, then it's either clustered or unclustered. Yes? Can you do something clever in the way, like, do you, you know exactly how many slots you're going to need, so can you do something clever where you go through and you say, like, I'm going to grab all the tuple that are page 101, put that in an output, but I will leave spaces open for the ones that I know are going to come from one of two, three, and four, and then you go and grab all the ones from one of two next, put that in another one. Can you do something like, something like that? Yeah, so he, his statement is, instead of actually every single time I uh, encounter a key, immediately go fetch it, what if I get all the thing, you know, keys that I, I need and the record IDs, and then now do combine the lookup so that I get all the ones from page 101 first, then all the ones from page 102? Yes. There, we'll talk about that in two weeks or next week, right, for scans. That's a common optimization. But that assumes that you can fit, like, the, you know, the, the key set in the, well, there are some algorithms where you actually can start producing output sooner rather than later. Uh, this is like an all or nothing. This is like what I've shown so far is I'm going to get all, you know, this operator asked me to get this data in sort of order. So I'm going to get it all now. And then I don't move on to the next operator until I, I get everything. There are some streaming operators where you can say, all right, just start streaming t data out as you get it because I'd rather have it sooner rather than later because like, there's other optimizations I can do up in the tree. So in that case, your, you know, your batch approach won't work. It won't work in that environment. But that, that is a common optimization. We'll see this in, in like next week. Okay. All right, so again, the, the main takeaway of this is if it's a cluster index and, and the, the, the query needs it to be sorted on the, on the key that the index is based on, then you just, you just use the clustered index. If it's not a clustered index, then you just almost never want to use it. All right, so that's basically it for discussing sorting. So let's talk about doing some other operations. So in particular, we're now going to focus on aggregations. Because for aggregations, it's another good, it's another good example of, or it is an example of a type of operator where we can make a choice between sorting versus hashing as our, for our algorithm. And they're going to have different trade-offs and have different performance characteristics uh, because one is essentially you know, trying to do a lot of sequential access and one's trying to do a random access. So there might be certain scenarios where one might be better than another. In general, as a spoiler, what I'll say is that in almost always in, in, the, in the case, no matter how fast the disk is, oftentimes the, the hashing approach will work better. And we'll see an example of how we can actually make the uh, a hashing aggregation do more sequential I.O. rather than random I.O. Right? So if you take the advanced class in the spring, this is another big thing too, is like hashing always works super fast because everything's in memory. All right. So how would you use sorting to do an aggregation? Well, again, what is an aggregation doing? You're basically taking a bunch of values and you're coalescing them to produce a single scalar value. So with sorting, the nice thing about it is that because the data is sorted, as I said, when we take a pass now through the sorted output, we don't have to backtrack to compute our aggregation. We only have to do one pass to find, to compute whatever the answer it is that we want. So let's look, see a real simple query here. We want to do, a, uh, we're, doing, we're doing a scan on the enrolled table. Right, so a bunch of students enrolled in the classes, the database classes at CMU. And we, would, we just want to get the, all the distinct course IDs from any class where a student either got a B or a C in it. And we want the output to be sorted based on the course ID. So the very first thing we're going to do in our query plan tree is do the filter. So we're going to first filter out all the tuples uh, where the grade is not B or C. Then the next step we're going to do is remove all the columns we don't need in our output. Right, we only need the course ID. We only need the course ID to do the order by and for the distinct clause. Because for our filter, it accesses the grade table. At that point, we know in our query plan, we don't need to ever look at the grade, uh, the grade column anymore. We don't need to look at the student ID anymore. So we can strip all that out before we move on to the next operator. And then we finish off now by sorting uh, on, on, on this output column here. And because we're doing a distinct uh, aggregation or dis distinct clause, we want to remove any duplicate values. So all we need to do is just have our cursor scan through this 
and anytime it finds a value where that, that was same, same as the one it just looked at, then it knows it can throw it away. And it strips that out, and that's our final output. So we'll go into this more uh, uh, next week, or when we, when we talk about query planning, but just one obvious thing during this, in this pipeline of executing this query that I did was I try to strip out as much useless data as possible sooner in my, in my pipeline rather than later. So the very first thing I did was a filter. So say, you know, say this table had a billion records in it, but only five of them match or four of them match for my predicate. So rather than me sorting a billion records first, then going back and filtering it, it was better for me to filter it first, then move, that, move the data on to, to the next operators. Same thing for the projection, right? This is a row store, it's not a column store in my, in my example. So in order for me to go get the data I need to do you know, whatever the sorting I wanna do, I gotta go get the entire, you know, the entire record because that's gonna be packed together in a single page. But if I can do a projection, I can strip out all the columns I don't need or the attributes I don't need. And then now when I'm doing my sorting, I'm not copying around a bunch of extra data. So in my, my sort, of, sort of simple examples, uh, it was re related to her question, the, you know, what am I actually passing around? It could be the record ID, it could actually be the entire tuple itself, depending on how I want to materialize things. So the projection here allows me to throw away columns I don't need. So now when I'm, when I'm doing my, my sorting, I'm, I'm only, you know, I'm copying things that just related to what's needed for the rest of the query plan. Yes? For columns of like enum type, like for example, grade that can only take some six set of values, can we maintain some like counters like the minimum tuple number and the maximum tuple number to uh, like every time we insert a record, we just update those counters for that particular enum type and like when we are filtering this, we can always use those counters. So his question is, I mean, it's not related to this query. You're talking about like a count query. So his question is, the, the grade column is, has a fixed domain, meaning it's, it's A, B, C, D, or E. I don't think CMU has Fs, does it? You have incompletes, right? But it's, it's fixed. Oh, there's another the S one. That's whatever the problem is when i go put in your grades i can't tell whether you're an undergrad or a, a graduate student so i'm like oh this student got you know did awesome they get an a plus but then it throws an error because they're an undergrad and undergrads can't get a pluses unless you're ece which i think you can it's a nightmare but anyway so his question is all right so couldn't i have some kind of side table that has a tally that keeps track of every single time i insert a tuple with one of these values and I'm trying to maintain a count on them, I just increment that counter by one. Not counter like maximum record ID and minimum record ID, so that when you are filtering, you know which is the first ID and which is the last ID, so that you can filter only those pages. Within a page? No, like if you, are, you have 10,000 pages, and you know that the C grade is only in the first four pages, then you can bring only those four pages. Okay, now I understand. All right. So he, what he's saying is, say this was stored in a page, uh, this, this, this little example here is, is, is in one page. And then for the grade column, I could keep track of the min and max value. So in this case, B or C. So now if I'm saying I'm looking for all people that have the grade A, if I get to that page and I look and say, oh, why well, it's only between B and C, there's nobody that has an A in that page, I don't even bother looking at the column. That's what you're saying, right? Okay, I, we, I think we are talking about the same thing. What you're describing are called zone maps. Right? We'll, we will talk about this, um, I think next week or this week, I, I forget when. But basically there's a way to keep track of, you're talking about an auxiliary data structure on the side, that you looked at that first, and then you, then you, you check the page. Yes, so that's a zone map. You can, you could or could not be in the same page. You could have a separate page, you could be within the page. But it's basically a pre-computed information to say, the data, you're, here's the range of data that could possibly exist for each attribute, and you refer to that first and make decisions whether you need even to go further. Yes, th so those are called zone maps. They're called pre, um, Oracle calls them zone maps. Sometimes it's called pre-computed, uh, pre-computed uh, materialized aggregation sometimes. Different systems do different things, but that does exist. We'll cover that later, yes. I think the idea was that um, if I'm just looking that's an index, right? That's what an index does. You're talking about something more fine, like, like not an index, though. I think, right? Yeah, that's a zone map. What you're describing is an index. 
And again, the, the beauty of a declarative language like SQL is that I write my SQL query like this. I don't know whether I'm using zone maps. I don't know whether I'm using an index. I don't care. The database system will figure out what's the best strategy for me to go find the data that I want. Right? Essentially, you're just trying to, re trying to remove as much useless crap as quickly as possible. That's the whole goal of all of this. All right, so that, that, was, a, that was a tangent about zone maps. We'll, we'll cover that later. Um, the, the main point I want to the main takeaway from this was, was if I'm sorted, I do one pass and I can eliminate the duplicates. Right? In this example here, this worked out great for us because the output needed to be sorted on course ID. So I was, it was two for one. I did my sorting because that's the output I needed, but then I'm also in the sort order I need for my output. Right? So in this case here, doing a sorting based aggregation is, is, a, is a definite win for us. But in many cases, we don't actually need the output to be sorted. Right? So again, you still can use sorting for this. Like you can do for group buys and, 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 and doing distinct stuff. But if you don't need to be sorted, then this actually might be more expensive. Because again, the, the sorting process itself is not cheap. So this is where hashing can help us. So hashing is a way uh, for us to be able to sort of, do, again, another divide and conquer approach where we can split up the data set and guide our, the, the tuples or sort of the keys that we're examining to particular pages and then do our processing in memory on, on those pages. But again, hashing removes all, all locality, all uh, any sort ordering because it's taking any key and do, you know, doing some hash function on it and now it's going to jump to some random location. So we, this works great if we don't need sorting. Uh, we don't, think, don't need things to be ordered. So the way we can do a hashing aggregate is we're, we're, we're going to populate an ephemeral hash table as the data system scans the table or scans whatever our input is. All right? And then say we, uh, you know, when, when we do our lookup, depending on what kind of aggregation we're doing, if we do an insert and the key is not there, then we populate it. If it is there, then we may want to modify it or modify its value to compute whatever the aggregation that, that is that we want. Right? For, for distinct, it just I hash, see whether it's in there. If, it's, if it is, then I know it's already I, it's, a, it's a duplicate, so I don't bother inserting it. For the group by queries, for the other kind of aggregations, you, may, you have to update a running total. And we'll, we'll see an example of this. So this approach is fantastic if everything fits in memory. So the key thing I, I, I'm saying up above, I'm saying it's an ephemeral hash table, not an in-memory hash table. So ephemeral or, or transient means that this is a hash table I'm going to build for my one query. And then when that query is done, I throw it all away. And I'm going to do this for every single query. Right, so that, that, I mean, we said in the very beginning, we use data structures in different ways in the database system. So this is the example of a transient data structure. I need it for just my one query. I do whatever I want, then I throw it away. So if everything's in memory, the hash table is fantastic. Because it's 01 lookups uh, to, to go update things. Right? In this case here, also I'm not doing deletes. Right? It's just inserting things or updating things. If we need to spill a disk though, now we're screwed because now that this random randomness is going to hurt us. Because now I'm jumping around to different different pages or blocks in my hash table, and each one could be incurring an IO. So we want to be a bit, bit smarter about this and try to maximize the amount of work we can do for every single page we bring into memory. So this is what an external hashing aggregate does. And it's again, at the high level, it's the same way as the, it's the same technique that we did for external merge sort. It's a divide and conquer approach. So the first thing we're going to go through is take a pass through our data, and we're going to split it up into partition it into buckets, where so that all the tuples that are uh, either the same, all the tuples that are the same have the same key, will land in the same, same partition. And then we go back through in the second phase. And now for each partition, we're going to build an in-memory hash table that we can then do whatever it is that the aggregation that we want to do. Then we produce our final output, throw that, that in-memory hash table away, and then move on to the next partition. So again, we're maximizing the amount of sequential I.O. that we're doing. And for every single page, we, for every single I.O. we have to do to bring something into memory, then we do all the work we need to do on that one page before we move on to the, to the next ones. So we never, again, ne we never have to backtrack. So let's go through these two phases. 
So in the first phase, again, what we're trying to do is we're going to split the tuples up into partitions that we can then write out the disk as needed. So we're going to use our first hash functions just to split things up. And again, we use member hash, city hash, xxx hash 3, whatever, it doesn't matter. And so the reason why we're doing this is that because our hash table, is, our hash function is deterministic, meaning the same key will always be given the same hash value output, that means that tuples that have the same key will land in the same partition. And we don't need to hunt around for other parts of the, of the, of the table space, of the table, to find the same key. They're always going to be in, in our one partition. And our partitions can just spill to disk using the buffer hole manager when they, when they get full. So, so we, we have a page that, we, we, that we're storing the, the current partition data in. When that gets full, we just write that out to disk and start filling in the next page. So in this case here, we're going to assume that we have B buffers, and we're going to use B minus buffers uh, for the partitions, and at least one buffer for, for the input. So I'm going to bring in one page from my table, and I'm going to do a sequential scan on that page, look at every single tuple, and then it's going to write it out to B minus one partitions. Because right, you, you need to have at least one buffer in memory for each partition. Yes? Uh, can you explain what do you mean by matches? So, so if, if, say, I'm doing, I'm doing a group by on the course ID. Actually, here, next slide. I'm doing a group by on the, on the course ID. I'm, do, I'm doing aggregation. So I'm going to hash this course ID for every single tuple. If I have the same course ID, it's going to land in the same partition. So it's going to live there. Right, reside, live, stored, and then that way, when I want to go now do the, the, in this case the duplicate elimination, when I come back the second time, I know that the the tuples that that have the same key have to be in the same partition. They're not going to be some other random place. Is partition a page? His question is partition a page. No, partition would be like a it's a it's sort of a logical thing. Take the hash value. Uh, mod it by the number of, of partitions, and that's where you write into. And each partition can have multiple pages. All right, so again, we do our filter as we did before. We remove our projection columns. And then now we take our all the output of here. We're going to run it through our hash function, and we write it out to uh, the partition pages. So in this case here, I have b minus 1. So say there's like 4 or 5. I'm showing 3 here. So all the 15.445 keys land here. All the 158826 land here, and 15721 lands here. So again, you could be smart about this and say, "All right, well, I know I'm doing doing distinct. So within my page, if I see the same thing, then don't bother putting it into it. But for simplicity reasons, we're just we're just we're blindly just putting it in." Yes. The question is, what, what what is it? What is a partition? Again, think of like a partition is. Think of like it's like the 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 bucket chain in the chain hash table, you just have, within a, within a chain, you can have multiple pages. But I only have one page in memory as I'm populating this. Because again, for everything, every single time I'm going to cache something and insert it into this, I'm only inserting it into one page. And when this gets full, it gets again written out to disk. And I now allocate another one that, that I start filling up. So within memory, while I'm doing this first phase, I only need B minus one pages, because I have B minus one partitions. So this question is, what if the number of distinct course IDs... Yeah, I don't have enough buffers for the, the distinct course IDs. So you do, because you're hashing it, right? So you're taking hash mod... To, to take this hash value, mod it by B minus 1. So in this example here, for, I'm only showing three distinct keys. But like, I have another class, 15410. That could land in the same bucket as 15445. I don't need to have a partition for every distinct, every distinct key. The hashing allows them to go into the same thing. Your face looks like you're, you're like this. You're confused by this, right? Again, so I have fifteen four ten. I'm going to hash it. I mod it by b minus one. It lands in partition zero, and so I just append it to this to this this page. Right? And then the main thing is that 15.4.10 can't exist in any other page because the hash function will always guarantee that it's always going to point to this one. And if the partition overflows, you write it back to this? If the, partition, if the, if the current page of this partition overflows, I'd write it out the disk, 
and I allocate a new page and start filling that up. Basically, you mean you flush the page, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You flush, flush the page, allocate a new one, yes. Okay. And again, like at this phase, all we're doing is just partitioning. So I don't care, like I can be smart and say, oh, I'm doing duplicate elimination. I know I already have 1545 in here. I don't put it in. Ignore that for now, right? It's just I'm blindly putting things into this to, to, to the, the pages and writing them out. And when you, after you flush that like, overflow page, it's back to this, right? So yes. Have kind of like identifiers as in partition? Yeah, so, so, so his question is, it's getting written out the disk. Where am I storing the metadata that says, oh, partition zero has these pages? You have that in, 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 like in memory data structure. You keep track of like partition zero, here's the pages for it. Partition one, here's the pages for it. Okay. But that's small, right? That's like, that's nothing. Now, are we not considering the collision? His question is, are we not considering collisions? We don't care at this point. Right? It's, and I should maybe use another example than a distinct, because maybe that's fouling people up. But if I'm doing a, you know, a, a count, again, you can do that more efficiently as well, but like, like I don't care. I'm putting it in, inside of this. I don't care if there's collisions, because I'm going to resolve that in the second phase, when I rehash things. The your question is, where is this number coming from, B minus one? So that's the database system telling the, this query, the, whatever thread or worker that's executing this query, you have this amount of memory to use for query processing. Okay, so we cannot have B actually. We can have, like if I say a B is 100, we can't yeah, so like the data system says you're allowed to have B equals 100 pages to do whatever you want to do for execute the query. To ex execute this algorithm, I had, I'm going to use B minus 1 to store my part. Uh, I'll B minus 1 partitions because these partitions will have one page. If B is configured very small. It sucks, yeah. Her question, statement is if B is really small, you're <laughs> Yes. <laughs> right? I mean, there's, there's nothing you can do. It's not, it's not like you can, you know. You can't magically just add more memory, right? It's a finite resource. The database system, you know, is the is is doing resource management. It's deciding, oh, I have a lot of queries I need to execute at the same time, so therefore I can't let them all have a lot of memory. So this gets into the tuning side of things, which is actually very difficult as well. Yes. Okay. So. He says, and I don't have slides for this, we'll do it next class. He said that you're screwed. I'm, 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 let me rephrase what he said. <laughs> you're screwed, or you're whatever, if everything hashes into this bucket. So say this is, mo this is the most popular course on, on the campus. Everyone's taking 1545, right? <laughs> then as I hash it, everyone lands there, then I'm screwed, right? But again, this gets into the query, query planning side of things. The database system could look at and, and say, Oh, I know what the distribution of values are for, for this column, and everyone's taking 15, 40, 45. So therefore, if I do this technique, then I'm, it's not going to get any benefit because everything's going to hash to this, and it's all ways to work. I might as well just do a sequential scan. But you always don't know about the data. His question is, you always don't know about the data. Like, you know, a, a good data system will know something. It won't be entirely accurate, but it'll know something. Because you remove other columns also at this point, CID, like you have only one column, right? So then it might happen that only values in that column are column is skewed, other columns are making it different. So, all right, so his statement is like with the full data set, these can be these can be unskewed, but then this is skewed. Again, this is this is next week or two weeks. Uh, the data system can maintain metadata about every single column. Histogram, sketches, right? It can, it can do an approximation of what the distribution of values, values look like. Again, for skewed workloads, that's harder. You got a call? You, all right, he's got a call as parole. Yeah, all right, sorry. Um, he's out on parole, so that's why he's got a call as parole officer. All right, so for simplicity, I'm just saying assume uniform distribution, okay? For skewed workloads, again, there'll be a certain up to a certain point where this technique won't work, and a sequential scan will, will be the better approach. Yes. Uh, how much would you say the overhead for removing columns? His uh, Squ question is, what is the overhead of removing columns? So, in in this example here, uh, 
I'm showing this as like discrete steps, like filter and then remove. You can inline and combine these together. But in, again, this is another good example. There's a trade-off. So if my table is massive and I know that I don't need all the columns up, up, in the, up above in the tree, then it's totally worth it to me to pay the penalty to do this projection because you're essentially copying data. But if I only have one tuple, then I'll delay that, that maybe the projection as late as possible because that's going to be, it's just cheaper to do it at the very end. Right? There's the, a the trade off how wide and how, how, how tall the table is. And the, again, the data system can figure this out, or at least attempt to. Okay, so what we're doing here in the first phase, we're, we're taking the course ID, we're hashing it, we're putting it into these, these pages for the partitions. So now in the second phase, when we rehash, for every single partition, now we're going to bring, bring, bring the, the pages in, right? And then we're going to build an in-memory hash table that we can then use to, uh, to find the, the same keys. So we don't have to do this. We could just bring in every single partition and do a sequential scan on them. But because we're doing aggregations, we know that we don't need, we don't need to have all of the duplicate keys in memory at the same time. So we're using a hash table to, to, to summarize it and could, uh, condense it down to just the bare minimum information that we need to compute our, our result. And again, the reason why we did the partitioning first is that when we go back in the second phase and we do rehashing, we know that all the keys that are the same will exist in the same partition. So once we go through all the pages within that partition, we compute whatever the answer that is that we want, we can, we can potentially throw that, that hash table away because we know that there's, or at least produce it as an output, because there's no that it's the keys that we've updated so far through that one partition will never get updated again through any other partition. Because the hashing guarantees locality for us. All right, so back here, right, these are all the buckets we generated in the first phase. So let's say now that we can bring in, uh, you know, we can bring in, you know, these two pages or all the partitions. For, all, we can process these two partitions in memory at the same time. So all we're going to do is just have a cursor that can just scan through them. And every single key, you're going to hash it and populate the hash table. And I keep just scanning down and do the same thing for every, everything else. And then now I produce this as my final result. Again, for some, realize it may be confusing. The final result of this hash table is the same as this one. But you know, and the main takeaway is that we're going to throw this away when, when we move on to the next, the next partitions. Right? And th this one we, we keep around. Distinct is like a little bit too simple, but like it, I was trying to pick something that just distilled down the core ideas. All right, so now we got this other partition here. So again, we blow away the, the hash table from the first the first, first set of partitions. We do the same thing, build an in-memory hash table for this guy, and then we just when it's done, we then just populate this thing. Yes. Her question, her statement is: we're Assuming we're not going to have collisions in the second hash function, you you absolutely can, right? Her, so her statement is: Question is, what does that mean? You be you be overriding this? Yeah, like if it hashes to the same place. Um, but that, so that that does the co the collision handling schemes that we talked about when we talked about hash tables. So it's either linear probing, cuckoo hash, uh, whatever the Robinhood stuff, okay. right? That's all like internal to the hash table. We're sort of above it now. We're saying you have a hash table. I can write things into key value pairs, and it, it'll it'll store them for me. Uh, I don't know and I don't really care at this point how it handles collisions. Okay. Again, distinct is, is a really stupid, simple example, but you know, going through this process is, 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 is the main thing I want you guys to get. How is this faster than sorting all the linear Okay, his statement is, the question is, how is this faster than, than sorting? Mm -hmm. uh, for this particular query, probably not. Uh, it depends on the depends on the size of the data. Um, I'll cover those. Let me let me let me punt on that question till next week, and then it'll, it'll be more clear when we start seeing like the different join algorithms.
Yes. Why do we need a second hash table, by the way? Like, we're just talking about it from there to find a result. Right? Yeah, so, so again, th because this is, his question is, why do we need this when it's just this, when I just write into this? In that example, yes. But like, I was trying to show that you, like, you have an ephemeral hash table that you build, populate, and then when you're done, then you shove it into this thing. For distinct, it, it's stupid, it doesn't make sense. For aggregations, uh, for other aggregations, you could potentially do that as well. All right? Because again, this, like, this may not fit in memory. Yes? Is there a reason why we use the same hash function and don't change it, or do we have to use the same hash function? Oh, so yeah, so, so I should be clear. This is, this is a different seed. Same, so, you know, remember hash with a different seed. But like, between like, the, each phase, like, we're going to the first two buckets, maybe we move to the third bucket. Do we need to change the hash function? Do we not need to change it? This question is, like, say I, 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 I built this first hash table, and I use, I use a, one seed for the hash function. Now down here, do I need to use, can I use a different seed? I don't think it matters, right? If you're writing into this, if you're writing into the same hash table, you absolutely have to use the same seed. If you're just going to merge that in later on, it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't want to affect like, the order of the power itself. No. It's yeah. Yes. The final result is it a hash table or just a Yeah. The final result, the final result of, a, of, a, of the database, or sorry, the final result of an operator is always going to be a, a relation. So this is, it could be a hash table, it could be just a, a buffer of pages. Depends on the implementation. And I realize that like it's the same shapes. Yeah, sorry. All right, so finish up. Let's talk about, do something more complicated. Let's actually how to do, uh, you know, aggregations where you know, you're actually producing a real result. So for this one, the, the, the intermediate hash table that we're using for the, the second phase, we're actually going to use that to maintain the running total of whatever it is the computation we're trying to do in our aggregate, fu aggregate function, right? And so this running value would depend on what the aggregation you're actually trying to do. So it's going back here. So Saying all of these guys, now I'm doing a, I'm getting the, the course ID and I'm computing the average GPA. So in the hash table that I could be generating for all of these, I'm going to have the, the key mapped to this like tuple value that's going to keep the running count of the number of keys that I've seen with, sorry, the number of tuples I've seen with the same key and then the, just the summation of, of their GPAs. Right? And then I just take this thing. And then when I want to produce the final output, I take the running total divided by the number of tuples, and that's how I get my average. So for all the different hash, the different aggregation functions, in general, you just keep track of you know the, the, a single scalar value, a count. You're just adding one every single time you see a new key, uh, or a key with the same value, and then for sum, you just keep adding values together. For the average, you, you can compute that with um, with the the number, the count plus the sum. Standard deviation or other, other aggregation functions, you, you, you maintain a little bit more information. So now basically what happens in our hash table, when we, when, it, when we want to update the hash table, we do an insert. If it's not there, we just add it. If it is there, then we need to be able to modify this in place or do a delete followed by an insert to update it. So is this clear? And again, if you were doing this with sorting, you could do the same thing. You would have this on the side and then as you scan through in, in the final sorted output, you, would, you could update these totals and produce the final output. All right, so I'm going to skip this for now. Um, this will make more sense when, next week when we, do, when we do hash joins. Essentially, a hash join is going to essentially do the same thing, that we're going to build this ephemeral hash table with, on, on, on the keys we want to do a join on, and then we probe in that to see whether we have a match and we produce our final output or, of, of, the, of the operator. Okay? So let's, let's skip this, uh, and then we'll focus, we'll, we'll discuss this again next week, when we, or next, next Wednesday when we do hash joins. Okay? All right, so uh, in conclusion, so what I showed today is this sort of the trade offs between sorting and hashing. And again, we'll go to more details about which one's better than the other when we talk about joins next week. Um, the high level techniques that we talked about here are we applicable for other parts of the database system so this partitioning uh, approach this divide and conquer approach 
All that is useful for other algorithms, other methods we, ha we, we care about in our system. So we'll see this recurring theme throughout the rest of the semester that splitting things up into smaller units of work and, and trying to operate on that small, small chunk of data or small problem is going to be very, very useful technique. Okay? All right, so let's talk about project two. So project two, you are going to be building a thread-safe linear probing hash table. So this is going to be built on top of the buffer pool you built in the first project. So it's not an in-memory hash table. It has to be backed by disk pages. So we're not going to do anything uh, that we talked about here in this class. We're doing trying to maximize sequential I.O. It's just you do random I.O. and you go grab pages from, from your buffer manager as needed, right, to do, to do inserts and deletes. So you are going to have to support resizing. So again, linear probing hash table assumes it's a static hash table. But when it gets full, then you need to take a latch on it and then resize the entire thing. So you need to support resizing as well. And you need to support doing this resizing when multiple threads could be accessing the, the hash table at the same time. So the, the, the website is up. The, it's not announced yet on Piazza. Uh, we'll, we'll, we're, we're make, there's some final adjustments we're doing for the source code before we release it to you guys. But we hope to have this will be up later today. I don't know. Sorry, animations. All right. So there's four tasks you're going to have to do. The first is that you're responsible for designing the page layout of the hash table blocks. So this is the header page and then the actual block pages where the actual key values are stored. So this is a useful exercise to get you to understand what it means to take a, you know, a page from the buffer pool manager and then be able to interpret it in such a way that it stores the data exactly that you want. Right? It's not you're just mallocking some space. You're going to the buffer pool manager and says, give me a page. And you say, oh, this is a, this is a hash table block page. Here's the offsets to find the data that I'm looking for. How to essentially do a reinterpret cast on that data. So you first implement those two classes to do the header page and then the block pages. Then you want to implement the basic hash table itself, right, to do inserts and deletes. And then you can also support uh, concurrent operations using a reader writer latch, which, which we provide you, and then also support resizing. You take a latch on the entire table, double the size of it, and then rehash everything. So you need, you need to be able to support that. So you should follow the, the textbook uh, semantics and algorithms for how they do, uh, you know, they do the various operations. Uh, or, or I think the lecture I gave on, on the linear hash table follows the textbook uh, pretty closely. And the linear hash table doesn't have that many, you know, different design decisions you have to make. It's just sort of going through the exact steps. Um, I advise you to first obviously work on the page layout because, you know, you can't have a hash table unless you can store it in pages anyway. But you should make sure that your pages work perfectly before you move on to actually building the hash table itself. So we'll provide you some basic test, test cases, again, to do some rudimentary checks for your page layouts. But it's up for you to guys to, to make sure that it's actually, you know, do something more rigorous. Because if your page layout gets fucked up, and then now you start building your hash table on that, it's like building a house on sand, because now you're like, my hash table's not working, and it, be, it could be because the, your pages aren't working correctly. So get this down solid before moving to the next thing. Then when you, uh, when you actually build the hash table itself, don't worry about making it thread safe. Focus on the uh, on, on you know, single threaded support first. This is a common design approach in database systems. This is the approach I take with my own research. And in practice, I think this is not every company follows this. He's wearing the shirt for the company that, that does not follow this. Uh, the focus on correctness first. Don't worry about it being slow. So make it, you know, make sure that it works exactly the way you think it should work. Then go back and now start doing the optimizations that some of the things he suggested, some of the things we talked about in class, to be, you know, uh, to do optimistic latching, be more, more crafty on how you release latches, right? Make sure it works correct first. Have test cases to prove that it works correctly for you. Then when you go start trying to make it go faster, because we'll have a leaderboard to see who has the fastest hash table, then, you know, then you know that you're, you're working with a, again, a, a solid implementation. Okay? All right, so just like before, you don't need to change any other files in the system other than the ones that you have to submit on Gradescope. Uh, this is what we're working on now. So we'll send an announcement on Piazza that you want to rebase your existing code on top of the latest master because that'll bring in the new uh, the sample header files and the, the sample test cases for you. Uh, we'll provide instructions on, on exactly what you need to, need to do to rebase. Obviously, make, you know, since you can blow away your source code on, on GitHub very easily with a push, push force, 
Uh, <laughs> make sure you make a backup of your, of your copy of the first before you uh, start doing the rebase. Um, and then, as always, post your questions on Piazza and, uh, and come, come to office hours. Yes? Uh, if all the testers are passing in the first homework, can we safely assume that our will work perfectly? Or His question is, if we assume, if you get a 100% score on the first project, can you assume that your, your buffer pool implementation is solid to support a hash table? Yes. I could be wrong, but we, we think we tested it pretty great. <laughs> but, right, but I, I would say, like, uh, there was a bug last year that that exact problem showed up. That's all been resolved. So I, I think if you've passed our test, it, sh it should be solid. So could you now release the test code? This question is, could we now release the test code? I cannot do that because there's some people that are still uh, haven't submitted yet. Okay, <laughs> Let's take that all fine. In the back, yes. For the sorry, for the first project, you can submit as much as you want. Yeah, yeah. Whatever, whatever, whatever the highest score you got from the last. Actually, Grayscale lets you activate which score you want, right? I think, but it's whatever the highest score up into the deadline is what we'll use. Yeah. Yeah, you submit as, as all you want. You like if you get if you had an eighty before and have a hundred after the deadline, you have an eighty score. You can play the game with it like the late days, but that you know, yeah. What if you were to change your implementation? Like you got um, your score and then you change your implementation one Again, so your question is, what if you change your implementation after the fact uh, for from project one? The it, it would still be you still be allowed to submit on Gradescope the old project to, for project one. We could just have it throw in the, the first test as well if you want. To, if that make it easier, you, like it'll run all the, the tests from the first pr project. You won't get a score for that, but it'll, it'll just be there. We could do that. We'll fix that. Okay. What's that? Yeah, it'll make it slower. That's the only thing. Yeah, but you can still be able to submit for the the, the first one. Okay. Do not plagiarize. We run the, we're we're going to run this in the moths. This is, we're doing that this week for your first project. If you plagiarize, we'll fuck over Warner Hall and be kicked out. Okay? Don't do that. Next class, we're doing joins. Nested loop joins, sort merge joins, and hash joins. Okay? All right, he's got a call. He's not here. All right, guys. See ya. Oh dear, coming through with my shell and poo. Two cent for a case, give me St. Nas poo. In the midst of broken bottles and crushed up can. Met the cows in the jam, oh, I'll try it. With St. Ives in my system, crack another, I'm blessed. Let's go get the next one and get over. The object is to stay sober, lay on the sofa. Better yet, down my shoulder. Who be the be champ, stressed out, could never be son. Rick is a jelly, hit the deli for a cold one. Naturally blessed, yes, my rap is like a laser beam. The pawns in the bushes, St. Ives, St. Ives, St. Ives, St. Ives. Crack the bottle of the St. Ives, sip it through those who don't realize. The drinking ain't only to be drunk, you can't drive. Keep my people still alive, and if the saint don't know you from a can of paint, paint.